Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is The Boy Who Snared the Sun, as told by William T. Larned in American Indian Fairy Tales, published in 1921. To be honest, I question the source of this story, and it's probably more accurate to describe it as a story with elements of Native American mythology rather than an authentic Native American fable. But we'll get into those details later. Right now, let's open our imaginations and begin. A deep, crusted snow covered the earth and sparkled in the light of a wintry moon. The wind had died away. It was very cold and still. Not a sound came from the forest. The only noise that broke the perfect quiet of the night was the cracking of the ice on the big sea water, Gichigumi, which was now frozen solid. But inside old Iago's teepee, it was warm and cheerful. The teepee, as the Indians call a tent, was covered with the thick, tough skin of the buffalo. The winter coat of Mukwa, the bear, had now become a pleasant, soft rug for Iago's two young visitors, Morning Glory and her little brother, Eagle Feather. Squatting at their ease in the warm fur, they waited for the old man to speak. Suddenly, a white-footed mouse crept from his nest in a corner and, advancing close to the children, sat up on his hind legs like a dog that begs for a biscuit. Eagle Feather raised his hand in a threatening way, but Morning Glory caught him by the arm. No, no, she said. You must not harm him. See how friendly he is and not a bit afraid. There is game enough in the forest for a brave boy's bow and arrow. Why should he spend his strength on a weak little mouse? Eagle Feather, pleased with anything that seemed like praise of his strength, let his hand fall. Your words are true words, Morning Glory, he answered. Against Amik, the beaver, or Wabese, the wild swan, it is better that I should measure my hunter's skill. At this, Iagu, turning around, broke his long silence. There was a time, he said mysteriously, when a thousand boys such as Eagle Feather would have been no match at all for that mouse as he used to be. When was that? asked Eagle Feather, looking uneasily at his sister. In the days of the great Dormouse, answered Iagu. In the days long ago when there were many more animals than men on the earth, and the biggest of all the beasts was the Dormouse. Then something strange happened, something that never happened before or since. Shall I tell you about it? Oh, please do, begged Morning Glory. The story I am going to tell you, began Iagu, is not so much a story about the Dormouse as it is a story about a little boy and his sister. Yet, had it not been for the Dormouse, I would not be here to tell about it, and you would not be here to listen. To begin with, you must understand that the world in those days was a different sort of place from what it is now. Oh, yes, a different sort of place. People did not eat the flesh of animals. They lived on berries and roots and wild vegetables. The Great Spirit, who made all things on land and in the sky and water, had not yet given men mondamin, the Indian corn. There was no fire to give them heat or to cook with. In all the world there was just one small fire, watched by two old witches who let nobody come near it, and until Coyote, the prairie wolf, came along and stole some of this fire, the food that people could manage to get was eaten raw, the way it grew. They must have been pretty hungry, said Morning Glory. Oh, yes, they were hungry, agreed Iago, but that was not all. There were so many animals and so few men that the animals ruled the earth in their own way. The biggest of them all was Bosch Quadosh, the Mastodon. He was higher than the highest trees, and he had an enormous appetite. But he did not stay long on earth or there would not have been food enough for all the other animals. I thought you said the Dormouse was the biggest, interrupted Eagle Feather. Iago looked at him severely. 
At the time I speak of, he continued, Bosch Quardosh, the Mastodon, had just gone away. He had not gone a bit too soon either, for by this time the only people left on the whole earth were a young girl and her little brother. Like Eagle Feather and me? asked Morning Glory. The girl was much like you, said Iagu, patiently, but the boy was a dwarf who never grew to be more than three feet high. Being so much stronger and larger than her brother, she gathered all the food for both and cared for him in every way. Sometimes she would take him along with her when she went to look for berries and roots. He's such a very little boy, she said to herself, that if I leave him all alone, some big bird may swoop down and carry him off to its nest. She did not know what a strange boy he was and how much mischief he could do when he set his mind upon it. One day she said to him, Look, little brother, I have made you a bow and some arrows. It is time you learn to take care of yourself, so when I am gone, practice shooting, for this is a thing you must know how to do. Winter was coming, and to keep himself from freezing, the boy had nothing better than a light garment woven by his sister from the wild grasses. How could he get a warm coat? As he asked himself that question, a flock of snowbirds flew down nearby and began pecking at the fallen logs to get the worms. Ha, said he, their feathers would make me a fine coat. Bending his bow, he let an arrow fly, but he had not yet learned how to shoot straight. It went wide of the mark. He shot a second and then a third. Then the birds took fright and flew away. Each day he tried again, shooting at a tree when there was nothing better to aim at. At last he killed a snowbird, then another and another. When he had shot ten birds, he had enough. See, sister, he said, I shall not freeze. Now you can make me a coat from the skins of these little birds. So his sister sewed the skins together and made him the coat, the first warm winter coat he had ever had. It was fine to look at, and the feathers kept out the cold. Eh, hey, yeah, he was proud of it. With his bow and arrows, he strutted up and down like a little turkey cock. Is it true, he asked, that you and I are the only persons living on earth? Perhaps if I look around, I may find someone else. It will do no harm to try. His sister feared he would come to some harm, but he had made up his mind to see the world for himself, and off he went. But his legs were short, and he was not used to walking far, and he soon grew tired. When he came to a bare place on the edge of a hill where the sun had melted the snow, he lay down and was soon fast asleep. As he slept, the sun played him a trick. It was a mild winter's day. The bird skins of which the coat was made were still fresh and tender, and under the full glare of the sun they began to shrivel and shrink. Eh, hey, yeah, what's wrong? he muttered in his sleep, feeling the coat become tighter and tighter. Then he woke, stretched out his arms, and saw what had happened. The sun was nearly sinking now. The boy stood up and faced it and shook his small fist. See what you have done, he cried with a stamp of his foot. You have spoiled my new birdskin coat. Never mind, you think yourself beyond my reach up there, but I'll be revenged on you. Just wait and see. But how could he reach the sun? asked Morning Glory, her eyes growing rounder and rounder. That is what his sister asked when he told her about it, said Iago. And what do you think he did? First, he did nothing at all but stretch himself out on the ground where he lay for ten days without eating or moving. Then he turned over on the other side and lay there for ten days more. At last he rose to his feet. I have made up my mind, he said. Sister, I have a plan to catch the sun in a noose. Find me some kind of a cord from which I can make a snare. She got some tough grass and twisted it into a rope. That will not do, he said. You must find something stronger. He no longer talked like a little boy, but like one who was to be obeyed. Then his sister thought of her hair. She cut enough from her head to make a cord, and when she had plaited it, he was much pleased and said it would do. 
He took it from her and drew it between his lips, and as he did this it turned into a kind of metal and grew much stronger and longer, till he had so much that he wound it round his body. In the middle of the night he made his way to the hill, and there he fixed a noose at the place where the sun would rise. He had to wait a long time in the cold and darkness, but at last a faint light came into the sky. As the sun rose, it was caught fast in the noose, and there it stayed. Iago stopped talking and sat looking into the fire. One might have supposed when he did this that he saw pictures in the flames and in the red coals, and that these pictures helped him to tell the story. But Morning Glory was impatient to hear the rest. Iago, she said timidly at last, did you forget about the Dormouse? Eh, uh, the Dormouse. No, I have not forgotten, answered the old man, rousing himself. When the sun did not rise as usual, the animals could not tell what had happened. Ajidaumo, the squirrel, chattered and scolded from the branch of a pine tree. Kagagi, the raven, flapped his wings and croaked more hoarsely than ever to tell the others that the end of the world had come. Only Makwa, the bear, did not mind. He had crept into his cave for the winter, and the darker it was, the better he liked it. Wabun, the east wind, was the one who brought the news. He had drawn from his quiver the silver arrows with which he chased the darkness from the valleys, but the sun had not risen to help him, and the arrows fell harmless to the earth. "'Wake! Wake!' he wailed. "'Someone has caught the sun in a snare. Which of all the animals will dare to cut the cord?' But even Coyote, the prairie wolf, who was the wisest of them all, could think of no way to free the sun. So great was the heat thrown out by its rays that he could not come within an arrow's flight of where it was caught in the magical noose of hair. "'Leave it to me!' screamed Ken Iu, the war eagle, from his nest on the cliff. "'It is I alone who soar to the sky and look the sun in the face without winking. Leave it to me!' Down he darted through the darkness, and up he flew again with his eagle feather singed. Then they woke the Dormouse. They had a hard time doing it, because when he once went to sleep, he stayed asleep for six months, and it was almost impossible to arouse him. Coyote crept close to his ear and howled with all his might. It would have split the eardrum of almost any other animal. But Kug Ibin Gwakwa, the Dormouse, only groaned and turned over on the other side, and Coyote had a narrow escape from being mashed flat like a corn cake. There is only one thing that will wake him, said Coyote, getting up and shaking himself. I will run to the mountain cave of Ani Miki, the thunder. His voice is even more terrible than mine. So off he went at a gallop. Soon they could hear Ani Miki coming. Boom, boom. When he shouted in the ear of the Dormouse, the biggest beast on earth rose slowly to his feet. In the darkness he looked bigger than ever, almost as big as a mountain. Animiki, the thunder, shouted once more to make sure that the Dormouse was really wide awake and would not go to sleep again. Now, said Coyote to the Dormouse, it is you that will have to free the sun. If he burned one of us, there would be little left but bones. But you are so big that if part of you is burned away, there will still be enough. Then in that case, you would not have to eat so much or work so hard to get it. The Dormouse was a stupid animal, and Coyote's talk seemed true talk. Besides, as he was the biggest animal, he was expected to do the biggest things. So he made his way to the hill where the little boy had snared the sun and began to nibble at the noose. As he nibbled away, his back got hotter and hotter. Soon it began to burn till all the upper part of him burned away and became great heaps of ashes. At last, when he had cut through the cord with his teeth and set the sun free, all that was left of him was an animal no larger than an ordinary mouse. What he became then, so he is today. Still, he is big enough for a mouse, and perhaps that is what Coyote really meant. Coyote, the prairie wolf, is a cunning beast, up to many tricks, and it is not always easy to tell exactly what he means.
The best sentence in this story is, Besides, as he was the biggest animal, he was expected to do the biggest things. I love stories that explain the origins of things, and this story has such an interesting cosmology. The girl and her small brother are the only people on Earth, and every morning the east wind fires silver arrows that chase away the darkness. The mastodon has just departed, leaving the dormouse as the largest creature on Earth, and crafty coyote is in charge of everything. So, of course, all of this does fill me with questions, and the biggest surprise for me is that the mastodon did, in fact, coexist with humans in North America. The Clovis and pre-Clovis people, active around 13,000 BC, apparently primarily relied on megafauna as a food source, and we found lots of evidence of human predation of mammoths. At the end of the Pleistocene era, most North American megafauna went extinct, partially due to overhunting by the humans who had recently migrated there, so that part of the story actually does hang true. However, there is no way that Native Americans in the pre-colonial period could have encountered the Dormouse. The Dormouse is an old-world creature. It's native to Africa, Asia, and Europe. This story accurately describes the fact that it sleeps for up to six months. It actually will sleep longer if the weather doesn't get warm enough. And I just don't understand how a dormouse can be part of an authentic Native American fable. But if anybody knows more about this than I do, please do drop me a note in the comments below. This brings us to the problem of authenticity of this story and actually of the whole book. Uh, William T. Larned wrote this book, crafting the frame story of this grandfather figure, Iagu, telling stories to the children, and then weaving in stories that he got from the work of Henry Rowe Schoolcraft. Now, Henry Rose Schoolcraft, as a young man, worked for the U.S. government, and he went out and made contact with a bunch of Native American tribes, and he learned their language and their culture. Although, as we've noted before on the channel, they were not good standards for this kind of anthropological research at the time, he was the real deal. He learned the languages, he married a Native American woman, and he recorded these stories and other customs and practices and beliefs very faithfully to how they were related to him. This is incredibly valuable research, and it's wonderful to have today. However, later in life, he became a bad guy, and his biracial children disowned him. And that always raises the question of whether he became a bad guy or was he a bad guy the whole time. Anyway, this particular story does not appear in Schoolcraft's original Native American folklore research, as far as I can find it. It appears in a book of Native American stories he wrote for children. And so I can't tell if it's an authentic story collected during his travels or if he just made it up. Lorne, in his turn, credits Schoolcraft as his source, but he heavily edited these stories on his own. And as I've mentioned before on the channel, it would be lovely to reference actual Native American sources for this kind of material. Um, but for the purposes of the channel, I'm restricted to what's in the public domain, and most of those works are just much more recent. This is one of those cases where uh, I am just enjoying the stories themselves with a grain of salt and overlooking the source. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession, and here's a micro-confession before the real confession. The micro-confession is I got halfway through recording the story with the microphone pointed away from me, and I, <laughs> it took me forever to try to figure out what was wrong with my audio, and I had to um, stop and start over beginning with. The real confession is that I'm already late recording this week because there's been a Kermis, a kind of mobile amusement park, in town for the past several days. And although I am several blocks away from the action, so to speak, it is still possible in my office to hear the shrieks and screams of people on the rides. <laughs> and they are screams of delight, of course, but you wouldn't know that. And uh, I'm comfortable with the sound of ambient rain or birdsong or whatever, but piercing shrieks aren't quite the ambience I'm going for in my recordings. <laughs> so it's fine, of course, to be late. I'm not really on a deadline. Uh, and now I know just how far the sound of the Kermis actually carries. 
I'm still working on improving the acoustic qualities of this room and pointing the microphone the correct way really helps. Um, but home improvement takes a long time, you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm worried that it actually maybe never ends. I kind of thought this was a project taking place in phases, but I keep adding more phases at the end. So is this just the new normal? Anyway, if you like old, interesting stories that are far from normal, subscribe to the channel. At Restored Lore, I bring you odd and obscure stories every week, and if you choose notifications, you won't miss a thing. Also, please drop a like on this video and leave me a comment down below. I do love your reactions, and it actually really does help boost the channel. Thank you so much for your support. I will see you next week.